Welcome to another edition of Canine Conversations, the podcast that talks about everything dog. We're climbing the charts. We're just knocking it out of the park here. Everybody's loving this podcast, and it's because I'm gearing it towards what you want to hear. I'm getting emails and, 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 and notes and, and feedback from all over the world, people listening to this podcast. It's helping you uh, better train your dog. It's helping you better understand your dog and all these things. And I think that's just fantastic. It makes my life work so much more meaningful. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Please also follow my videos, check my membership section, and you can find all that information on my website, your one-stop shop for dog lovers, robertcabral.com. Today we're gonna talk about choosing the right dog. Now we've talked about several similar aspects of dogs in the past, but choosing the right dog, getting the dog that's gonna be the perfect dog for you is really super important. Now. The holidays are coming up. I'm going to do another podcast on not giving a dog as a gift because I think it's a horrible, horrible, horrible gift. And I've done that podcast before, but we're going to talk about holiday dogs, how people get impulsive and you know all these other things. But what we're going to talk about today is choosing the right dog for the right person. It's kind of like a matchmaker uh, situation here where you really do have to choose the right dog. And people often choose dogs kind of like they choose partners by the way they look. So, oh, that dog is handsome or that dog is beautiful or whatever. And it's really the wrong reason to choose a dog because that beauty will, well, it won't fade on a dog like it does on a guy like me, but it does kind of uh, become irrelevant at some point. I still think Goofy's as handsome as he ever was and Maya's as beautiful as she ever was. But what I'm seeing is more of the personality because that's the thing you're gonna live with day to day is that personality, that drive, that temperament and such. And that's what you really need to look at when you first get a dog because you, you're taken by the puppy or you're taken by the, the dog in the movie or something like that, which is a horrible, horrible way to get a dog because you're seeing kind of like this painted picture of what the dog should be like and will be like, but it ain't, ain't gonna be like that. I can tell you that right now. You're gonna have a huge issue with the dog. So let's talk about um, choosing that dog. Now, first of all, if you love puppies, don't get a puppy because puppies grow up to be dogs and then they become annoying. And people who have puppies, you know, who love puppies usually are way too permissive with the dogs and then the dog ends up getting in trouble because it doesn't have structure, it doesn't have good, good, uh, good grounding, good um, uh, rearing by you, good, good basic training by you because you like the puppy and you think everything the puppy does is cute and it's a disaster when that dog gets older because it's much more fair to uh, school a dog or to ground a dog in what you will and won't accept when that dog is a puppy than letting it get away with everything, let it get away with everything, and then trying to change the dog. Just really, really bad. Bad for the dog, bad for you, bad for society. So we'll talk a little bit about that a little bit more as we get into this. But if you like dogs, it's good because, you know, puppies to me are very annoying puppies do all this crazy stuff and they scream and they do this and they do that. They're cute to look at, but that goes zero with me. I could care less about how they look because they need to grow into well-mannered, well-trained, well-socialized dogs. And that's something that's really, really important to do. So if you like puppies, not a good idea because you're going to end up spoiling the puppy. But if you like dogs, just put up with that puppy face because it's going to be a great dog once you get through that. Um, so Deciding on breeds or groups of dogs, and, and the difference is that you know the, we have the general dog, and then we have the groups of dogs, which are classified through the AKC. So the various breeds fit into groups. And you need to know that, and you need to understand that in order to be really clear on the dog you choose. So in other words, you don't have to pick a, a particular breed per se, but you're gonna pick a dog in a particular group, whether that's the working dog group, the sporting dog group, the herding group, the, the, the toy group, or anything like that. And I'm gonna break it down. I'm not gonna go through all the groups. I do that in my work at Bound Angels where we talk in shelters to shelter employees and shelter workers, shelter volunteers on how to better understand dogs. I really like them to know what are all the characteristics of certain breeds and certain groups of dogs because in the shelter these dogs kind of ended up being dumped there because stupid people ended up getting them and couldn't keep them because of certain reasons whether you know they moved to the one city in the united states that doesn't accept dogs or they could only find one apartment and that apartment didn't have dogs or didn't allow dogs or any other cockamamie stupid reason more than likely it's because they grew sick of the dog and they grew sick of the um the things the dog was doing wrong. And that's what we're gonna really have to address if we're gonna give dogs a good home. Dogs have a lot of behavioral 
personalities, let's say. And in those personalities, you're going to have a problem if you don't understand that that's the characteristic of that breed of dog or that group of dog or whatever it is. That's going to make it easy for you. So if we look at people choosing a dog strictly by looks, they're always going to get something that either looks like you know, a, a big, powerful dog because they, they want that big, powerful thing because maybe they're insecure with themselves or they want it for protection or whatever, or they're going to get the cute, adorable dog like the Husky. And that's really the wrong reason. So let's look at a couple of the groups of dogs, the, the, the breeds of dogs. So for example, like one group of dogs is called the herding group. And in the herding group, you have dogs like the Briards, the Shepherds, the, the Collies, the Sheepdogs, and anything like that. And the function of these dogs is to move livestock, right? So in other words, you could have a little corgi moving a big cow and or a big flock of sheep or a big, uh, you know, herd of whatever it is. The key thing you have to understand is the personality or the drive of the dog that allows them to do that or can, can get them to do that is the drive of the dog that you're going to be living with. And if you're living with that, it makes it super hard to have a normal life, especially if the dog comes from a working line breeding. So some people will get these dogs and then they'll breed, you know, confirmation or show lines. And in that show line, there'll be dogs that'll kind of seep through as pets because they have lower drive and they may have a crooked ear or they, you know, not a perfect tail set or something like that. And those often are really good dogs. Those are really nice dogs. If you pick them up from a good breeder, they, they, they'll be a really solid dog because the breeder will know the temperament of the dogs. I'm talking about a good breeder now. And they will kind of say, well, this dog doesn't have the temperament for the, the drive or for the, for the working ability that we want. For example, Janet has a friend who uh, competes with Labradors. And she had this Labrador that was just not going to cut it for the hunting or the, the agility and stuff like that that she wants to do with it. So she found the dog a new home. And Janet had another friend, Janet's like the matchmaker here, and put these two people together. And a young boy got a great dog. And this friend of Janet's was able to place a great dog with a great uh, person, a great family. And then we'll get another dog that's more high drive. But um, the, we're back to the herding breeds. The herding breeds have a lot of drive because they, 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 they're focused on movement. Much different from like a sporting dog, like a Labrador, where they have a different tenacity. I'm going to get into that in a second. But herding dogs, you always hear these problems where, you know, the dog is chasing a bicycle, the dog is chasing a skateboard, the dog is chasing children running, cats, the dog is chasing a host of other things. And that's just in their genetic drive. That's what they were genetically made to do. They were bred for that specific purpose, and that's just what they're going to do. You're not going to take that out of the dog, no matter how hard you try. And it's important to understand that some people will say, well, you know, I'll get a trainer and the trainer zaps the dog and corrects the dog and does this and does that. And eventually it's going to leak out somewhere else. So all these trainers who are doing that or who are saying, oh, I'll take the drive out of the dog. And they start with, you know, compulsive corrections, which got no problem with compulsive corrections, but done improperly, the dog is going to have a huge issue because that drive has to go somewhere. And I wrote an article about that. And I'll kind of readdress that in another podcast, but you don't get a dog that is a herding dog and take it to a trainer and turn it into a pet. It just, it doesn't happen. It, it, it's a disaster for the dog mentally and it'll be a disaster for you as the owner of the dog. So understand that like if you get a herding dog and that can be a border collie, it can be a German shepherd, it can be like I said, a collie, it can be a sheep dog or anything like that. When you get those dogs, they need a job to do. And that job is going to be something active. And if you don't have that kind of a, a ability to give the dog that kind of a job or that kind of a lifestyle, that just ain't the dog for you. And, and make that decision. No matter how cute the dog is or anything like that, the dog will not function for you and you're gonna have a hard time with it. First of all, all dogs need exercise. All dogs need socialization. All dogs need some kind of training and interaction. That's a positive experience for them. So um, as I go through the list here, don't think, oh, he's going to get to that one that just you know, is going to be a couch potato. I mean, there might be one or two in the breeds, but it's generally your dog needs some activity. Don't get, just get a stuffed dog. Just get, a, get you know, go to Amazon and order a stuffed dog and you'll have a great conversation piece. But um, hounds, hounds is another breed. Now hounds are great dogs for the purpose, but remember they were originally classified 
as sporting dogs because they're hunters. Hounds are hunters and they're great for people who are hunting. They have, and this can be anything from a sight hound to a scent hound. And sight hounds obviously track down their prey with vision, where scent hounds track down their prey with scent. Obviously, that's why they call them scent hounds. So whether it's coon hounds, Afghans, Basenjis, Borzoids, uh, even dachshunds, which you know dachshunds are originally bred to um, to suss out badgers. So it's a, it's a very very hard 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 breed. Um, these dogs are, are generally very active. They're very 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 busy and. Um, they need an outlet for that. They need, like, you know, even Bosman was, you know, was, was a crazy dog and, you know, it was, was a, wanted to go do lure coursing and just chase and chase and chase and chase until it basically had a heart attack. It didn't have a heart attack, thank God. But, um, but if, if that drive isn't harnessed or isn't channeled, I should say, then the dog would become destructive. And that would be any breed that has these um, characteristics. And remember that dogs were originally, it's a working animal. And because it's, that's why it was bred, it was bred to assist people. It wasn't really bred to just keep us company, which we like to think, and, and they are fantastic at doing that. But th their function was bred into these various breeds to do something. And if we don't do something with a dog that was bred to do something, they will do something. And that might be chewing your comforter or your chair or your rug or your wall or anything like that. Let's look at other dogs. For example, um, non-sporting dogs were originally all dogs were either sporting dogs or non-sporting dogs. Or, you know, and, and the idea became they split the, the, the other groups off from the sporting dogs, like, like the, the, um, the, the herding breeds and such, because they had more of a job to do. So then the non-sporting dogs um, go into dogs like the uh, Bichons, uh, Bulldogs, Sharpays, Chows, Dalmatians, Poodles, Shiba Inus, um, French Bulldogs and stuff like that. And they really, you know, they don't really qual quantify into any one thing because they're just non-sporting dogs. They're the dogs that really didn't have a job to do. They were just dogs that were bred to be dogs. And those are sometimes, if you're going to pick a dog with a, a lax lifestyle, those are probably going to be the better choice for you because of that, because they're not super high drive, they're not super um, focused on doing a job, and they usually make much better pets. Like I had two Sharpe, and they, you know, they just loved laying around and pretty much doing nothing. They still required a handler, like me, actually me, and who would give them the structure they need. So that's not to do with the job they need to do, but it's still that certain, the dogs need structure. Dogs need somebody who's going to make them responsible for their actions and, and hold their feet to the fire to do things or to not do things. And I don't mean literally, I don't want any animal rights um, protest against me. But the, the, the whole idea of these dogs is that they were so varied in the, in the non-sporting group that they were just not the dogs that were really doing the work. Then if we're gonna go into that, we're gonna also look at sporting dogs and we also have working dogs, which is another uh, characterization, another group in there. But the, the sporting dogs really came about with the invention of the gun. So in that line, they were, you know, the dogs, I'll give you a great example, Labrador retrievers, golden retrievers. They were bred to go out into the field with somebody who would shoot a bird and then that dog would run out and find that bird and bring the bird back, the dead bird. So that humans could be more lazy and not have to go out and do that. And the dogs had a great time doing it. And th that's a really important component that I was talking about earlier. For example, a herding dog, like a, a dog like Goofy, if he sees ducks running around or doing whatever, that's what he's going for. That's his drive to go for. And that's an intense drive. That's a prey drive. He's going to go after those ducks where a Labrador is not going to be as stimulated by that, but they're more stimulated by finding the dead duck and bringing it back. So it's a, it's a different drive and the genetics of it are fantastic and just super amazing to look at and to see. And you'll see that that is a really important component of selective breeding. Like the, the genetics were, were, were found, they were honed, and then they were continually bred to harness those abilities, like to go for a long, long, long distance, a Labrador will go a long, long, long distance to go find the bird or to find, you know, to, to run out. Where a shepherd doesn't have that tenacity. Their desire is not to run a straight line. Their desire is to herd and to run circles and do all that because 
that's their genetics and that's what they're meant to do with sheep or cattle or 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 you know whatever they're whatever they're hurting so um now pointers retrievers uh setter spaniels they're all in the sporting dog group and they definitely need a job to do if you look at Dwayne, he's always on the go he needs something to do just like goofy in different capacities but keeping them busy with something like agility or obedience or lure coursing uh, dock diving any of these activities are fantastic for these dogs and it makes their lives so much better and it gives you something to do this way you're not just sitting on your couch watching the podcast, listening to the podcast, watching the podcast, right? Although I like you to listen to it and I would like you to watch it, I want you to get off your butts and do something with your dogs. There's so many great activities, depending on the dog you get, that you should be doing something with it. Even if you go to a little, one of these kind of Zoom room kind of places and, and get your dog into agility and doing a little something or joining a little obedience club and doing a little bit of healing, a little bit of retrieving with your dog, those are such fantastic things that your dog is going to absolutely love doing with you and it's going to make your relationship better. I know you just want to sit around with them, I know you just want to watch TV with them, and I think it's great, but you got to get off your butt and do something. So nice walks, a jog, and make sure that when you get these dogs that you know what you're getting. For example, if you get a dog like a, an English Bulldog and then you want, you're super active and you want to go running and doing all this other stuff, that's not the right dog for that purpose. You need to pick the dog for the purpose you want. Very, very active dogs should go with very, very active people. The dogs need exercise, they need mental stimulation and physical stimulation. It's not just good to have one or the other. So oftentimes I'll take Goofy and Maya and I'll put them up on the treadmill and they'll run for 15 minutes and they'll get their yayas out and they're fine. After that, they still need training. It's not enough to just say, okay, well, you know, you ran 15 minutes or you went for a half hour walk or whatever. It's not enough. So um, I do advocate that you do give your dog a couple of walks a day because it's not only an exercise, but it is also a bonding and a stimulation for the dog when you're doing it together. Because they're sniffing, they're investigating, they're looking at things, you're talking to them, you're interacting with them. And that's what makes the, the interaction so, so beneficial for the dog and for you. Another group of dogs is the terriers. Now, I always say the terrible, tenacious terriers. That's what I say in all my lectures because terriers were really bred for a specific purpose. Remember, they can be anything from something super, super small, like a rat terrier, border terrier, to something huge, like an Airedale terrier or, or, you know, or, or bigger. They have little tolerance for other animals and this is because they were bred to hunt vermin. And, and that was their purpose. So they were in, intolerable of other animals because they were bred to hunt it out and kill those animals, what, whatever that vermin might have been. And that genetic, that drive is still in these dogs. So when people say, oh, you know, the pit bull terrier, it's a terrible dog, it's not necessarily because of the bully side of it, but it's because of the terrier side of it. And when you're mixing these two genetics, when you're mixing these two things together, and I'm hearing about a lot of people mixing genetics to make a great dog for agility. Nothing pisses me off more than that because it's so stupid that people say, well, I want a good dog for agility. And then they're mixing together things like, you know, Patterdales and Border Collies or, or Pit Bulls and Border Collies because it, they have an insane amount of drive. Take it from me. I say this is completely idiotic and stupid. Mixing two dogs because you want the one dog that's going to be great for your agility course is idiotic. Because you know what happens? When you breed the dog, the dog is going to have six, six puppies, maybe eight. Out of those puppies, you're going to find the one you like and you've got to rehome the other five or six, right? Now, what's going to happen from there is even though the dog doesn't have enough drive to do the sport, the agility sport, for example, they have too much drive for the average owner. Right? So you have the one dog you want and the five you don't want. And if you're not willing to take those five dogs, those puppies, look them in the eye and kill them, which is exactly where these dogs will end up, then you're making a huge and sorry mistake just trying to home them into pet homes. And that's one of the things I think is so incredible about, about reputable breeders of papered good dogs because what they'll do is they'll get these dogs, they'll breed for temperament, they'll breed for confirmation so the dogs don't have deformities and they'll make sure that each dog is placed in an acceptable home. And that's easy. If you're breeding Labrador Retrievers, you know, it's an easy dog to place because the Labrador is such an easy, good dog. And 
you can place those dogs. You can place them safely into a home. You can place them safely with children and stuff like that. But when you have a dog with an incredibly escalated drive, and by the way, this isn't just about agility people trying to breed a, a higher drive dog. This is also for protection people who are breeding Malinois and Shepherds and sometimes breeding in a, a Mastiff or something like that to get more size into it. It's completely idiotic and it pisses me off to the nth degree because I'm, I'm talking on the side of the dog. The dog has these drives that they don't know what to do with and they're not the right dog for most any owner. And if they're the right dog for a person who really wants that incredible drive, then the one that the guy who bred these, this, 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 this uh, breeding is giving away is not enough because he's going to keep the one that has the most. So we need to look at what's responsible and what's not responsible. And oftentimes people fall into that category of being very irresponsible and being very selfish. Whether that is by breeding two dogs together because they want their kids to see it, or they want the super high drive dog of a protection dog, or they want the super high drive dog of an agility dog, or whatever it is. And I, I'm kind of harping on this topic because I just posted a thing on my social media talking about that there's more tigers in captivity in the United States today than there are in the wild. Tigers are insanely, insanely endangered. Right now I've been to Africa and I've photographed lions and elephants and rhinoceros and all this, but tigers are insanely in crazy endangered. Right? There's only a few thousand left in the wild, but there's thousands and thousands and thousands living in, in homes and in, in you know, roadside zoos, which is so disgusting, in America. And the reason it's, it's insane is because one, the animal never gets to live to its true potential, which is to run, hunt, and, and live in the wild. So instead they're living in some idiot's cage in the Midwest somewhere. And if, if, if it's lucky, it just lives in the cage. If it's not lucky, it's being declawed, it's being, uh, it's being petted by a stupid tourists who think they're helping. And by the way, anybody who goes to one of these petting zoos and pets a lion or a tiger or whatever it is, and if you believe the lie that you're helping, you know, lions in the wild, that's the biggest crock of shit you can imagine. It's complete bullshit. And the reason they're telling you that is because they're liars. They're horribly, horribly selfish people. They're terrible human beings who take these animals and breed them. The, the cubs come out and they get petted and petted and petted. And then when they get older and they can't be petted anymore, they're either drugged so you can take a picture with them or they become, you know, the fodder. They just, they, they put them down or they sell them off for parts, you know, into the Asian markets and all that. So it's a complete disaster. And it's just a complete, uh, you know, synthesis for what I'm talking about here with dogs, that the wrong people get the wrong dogs. And any person is the wrong person to own a lion. I mean, that's completely moronic. Just like when I see people going out and getting borbles and mastiffs and corsos and, you know, and, and, and Malinois and, and these, you know, and these super intense, intense, intense dogs, because you can't handle that dog. You see the dog that, that uh, got uh, Baghdadi, the, the Malinois, and now everybody wants a Malinois. Well, I'm seeing a lot of Malinois ending up in shelters because morons are buying them and are then trying to think, well, I'm, I'm gonna be like the Navy SEAL. You're not a Navy SEAL, right? You, you couldn't cut it as a Navy SEAL on your best day alive. Navy SEALs are the most impeccably trained, strongest human beings on earth. They're, they're killing machines. I've had friends who are Navy SEALs. I respect them to the nth degree. Now, when these dogs are trained for those kind of assignments, they're handled by people who can handle them. They're trained by people who can handle them, bred by people who can handle them, and handled by people who can handle them. You're not that person, right? So when you see the, 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 the huge Ridgeback you know, or the huge Neo Mastiffs or the, 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 the Borbles, and you think you can handle that dog, you can't. You cannot handle that dog. And it makes me so disturbed when I see that. Exactly along these lines, it disturbs me when I see rescues or shelters or breeders selling dogs like big pits or high drive shepherds or even border collies to families with kids because they're not cut out for it. If you have a family with a kid, you can get yourself a little rescue lab mix or something like that and it's fine. 
But if you're gonna get one of these, especially like a game bred pit or a, a big Mastiff or a high drive Shepherd, you're going to have a disaster. So don't even get it in the first place. And I get all these emails from people who get these dogs, they get talked into it, they get sucked into it, and then they end up where the dog is biting people and doing this. And I just got a, a Facebook message from a, a friend of mine and a, and a former student whose friend has this Shepherd who is biting and it was dangerous. I think it was a Shepherd. And I said that the dog, you're gonna to have to put this dog down. There's no way around it. You can't just suddenly you know, transform this dog. It was a fighting dog, it was an aggressive dog, it had an aggressive tendency, and now you're gonna transform it. That ain't gonna happen. And that's where we really break down the picture of sanity. Because if somebody can't handle that dog, and that dog can't go to someone who can handle it and just goes to a shelter, and then the shelter says, well, we'll try to adopt it out to this person you're making a huge mistake. And the mistake therein lies that you're gonna get hurt, the dog is gonna hurt somebody or something, another dog or something like that, and then eventually the dog's gonna be put down anyway. So there are no great ranches in Malibu that take all these you know, uh, f foregone dogs that are aggressive and have only one home or anything like that. That doesn't exist. So if you get a dog, it's your responsibility from the day you get it until the day it takes its last breath. That's it, that's your job. And if you can't do that, if you can't own up and say, you know what, I'm gonna put 12 years or 14 years or 10 years or whatever it is into that dog, don't get it. Better the dog doesn't have a home in the beginning and ends up being put down than to be in the wrong home and shuffle through and shuffle through and emotionally and physically abuse its entire life. It's hard to say that, it's a tough pill to swallow, but I'm gonna tell you right now that dogs who end up in the wrong homes, for example, Pit bulls end up in so many different homes before they're two years old because so many morons get them and think they're gonna be the one who's, who can control it, and they can't. Because a pit bull is a really high drive dog. And I'm gonna get people gonna email me and say, oh, look at my pit bull, he's a, he's a couch potato. And I think that's great. But go to the shelter, see all the pit bulls that get turned in because they're so high drive, they're so intense, and they're very, very intelligent, and they're very pleasing to their, their, their owners, their humans that they become a disaster when they don't get that interaction, just like a dog, like a Malinois, or a high drive Shepherd, or a high drive Rottweiler. When they have that intense energy, that intense drive, and it's not channeled, it's a disaster, a complete disaster. And I urge you not to get a dog like that. I urge you to think about the dog you're gonna get, and I urge you to think about what that dog is gonna look like in three, three years, five years, six years, and when it gets older, can you handle that dog? Can you make that commitment? And if you don't have the financial ability or the physical ability, you know, if you're older, you know, if you're 60, 65, 70 years old, and you're going to get a pit bull, you're, you're the, unless you're a guy like me who's in amazing shape, but if you're just a regular person, you can't handle that dog. I hope, I, I don't, don't criticize me on that. It's kind of a half a joke, but I am in great shape. Okay, but make a decision of the dog you're gonna get based on knowledge and based on forecasting into the future. How long can you handle that dog? How good of an owner are you gonna be to that dog? And how long and how responsible will you be to that dog over the duration of that dog's life? So I'm gonna wrap it up on that. This is a really heartfelt podcast with a lot of energy about all these issues because I do think it's that important that the right person gets the right dog. And if you don't, it's a disaster. So hope you enjoyed the podcast. Tune in again next week, whole new topic. Be something completely different. I don't even know what it's gonna be yet. And check out my site, robertcabral.com, membership section, tons of great videos. You're gonna love it over there. Follow me on YouTube, Facebook, uh, Instagram, everywhere. There's always great topic, always updated. I'm always here for you guys. You love dogs, you're gonna love everything I do. And thanks for being here, see you later.